It was not just the fact that they were the boss, but at that time it was there was less rights for women as well. Welcome to Ms. Mojo, and today we're counting down our picks for the top 10 old Hollywood stars who rebelled against the studio system. Other actors feeling frustration such as I feel will not have to endure that. For this list, we'll be looking at those in the old Hollywood film crowd who tried to fight against the studios and or those who held power within the system as best they could. Did we miss any of your favorite rebels? Let us know in the comments below. Number 10. Frank Capra If it's an art form of any kind, then an artist should be the boss. I mean, I never heard of an art form but which which was made then which the, uh, the 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 art was made by by a committee. Mm committee. -hmm. Nowadays, Frank Capra is one of the most well remembered and beloved filmmakers of Hollywood's golden age. He was a big deal in his day as well. So much so that he thought he might have the juice to go up against Columbia Pictures and did so more than once. You have to find a way to get control of your films away from the from from those who consider film as some leisure, leisure time investment and uh, just an art in a conglomerate of some kind. In the 30s, he was said to have taken legal action against the studio after edits he didn't okay were made to Lost Horizon. Then, in 1946, he reportedly sued, arguing he should be paid for A Song to Remember, a film about Frédéric Chopin. This picture was directed by Charles Vidor, but Capra said some of his work from years earlier for what eventually became this project was used. It was not my word, sooner or later they're going to steal those melodies. Exactly. Number 9. Elizabeth Taylor Sometimes a gentle nudge against authority can change everything. On your knees. You dare ask the proconsul of the Roman Empire? I asked it of Julius Caesar. I demand it of you. During the days of the studio system, actors were beholden to making movies solely with the studio they were contracted to. Unless, that is, the studio agreed to lend them out or give them permission to also work elsewhere. Actress Elizabeth Taylor, who once described the system as a factory, was under contract with MGM until 1960. I was 10 years old when I first came to MGM, and I spent most of the next 18 years of my life behind the walls of that studio. But because of what we presume were her persistence and great powers of persuasion, she made many films not on the MGM lot. Some of her biggest, including A Place in the Sun and Giant, were crafted elsewhere. These projects often pushed the boundaries of the production code, dealing with issues considered taboo at the time, like abortion. It scares me. But it is a wonderful feeling. Number 8. Joan Crawford Don't call me anymore today. If there's any calling to be done, I'll call you. Many entries on this list have to deal with one man and his status within Columbia Pictures. Harry Cohn was one of the co-founders of Columbia. He was also a sexual predator who preyed upon actresses. Cohn had quite the reputation for demanding sexual favors from the studio's female actors and is sometimes credited with normalizing the practice in Hollywood. Many had no real say in the matter as he had great control over their careers and were victims of his horrid coercion. But there were a few stars who thankfully felt like they had enough control to say no. When Cohn approached actress Joan Crawford, she reportedly halted his advances with a casual yet direct reminder that she was seeing his wife and kids for a meal the next day. Look at her, standing up there staring down on us like a somebody. Go get her, drag her down! I've never done a thing to hurt any of you. Don't make me do it now. Number 7. Kim Novak Kim Novak was one of Columbia Pictures' most popular actresses in the 1950s. You gained a reputation, did you not? I know there's a hearsay, but it's what I read, for being quite difficult on one or two movies in, in this time in Hollywood. Was that because you were trying to assert yourself, that you were trying to I, say, I don't want any of this? I think to a large degree. That when she started spending time with singer Sammy Davis Jr., who was black, studio head Harry Cohn responded with hatred. The details of exactly what transpired are unclear, but it certainly seems Cohn had mobsters attempt to intimidate Davis Jr. into ending things. I mean, he did like to work with fear as his main, uh, mm. his main hold over everyone. Mm. The relationship between Novak and Davis Jr. didn't last long, and there is conflicting information about whether things were actually romantic. 
But the fact that they had this rapport in the first place was a huge rebellion for the time. This wasn't the only way Novak pushed back against Cohn, either. Much earlier in her career, she fought to keep her last name. She also reportedly rejected his advances. I mean, he put the fear of God in me. He was terrifying, <laughs> really. Oh, God. To walk in his office and to see just... And he was so... Um, well, he was uh, like, like a big gorilla, like King Kong. Number 6. Rita Hayworth Out of all the actresses at Columbia Pictures, Rita Hayworth had one of the most contentious relationships with studio head Harry Cohn. It was Harry who signed the star during her early days, and he did so with the expectation that Rita would sleep with him. Before her career took off, her then-husband Edward C. Judson reportedly ordered her to be intimate with Cohn. She held her own and didn't engage in relations with him, however. Good luck. Good luck. Thank you, Mr. Farrell. My husband tells me you're a great believer in luck. We make our own luck, Johnny and I. I'll have to try that sometime. I'll try it right now. The studio had tried multiple times to get her into bed over the years, and did not take her rejections well. Because of Hayworth's box office appeal, Cohn reportedly wouldn't end her contract, though. Instead, he settled for making her life miserable. He reportedly spied on her through bugs in her dressing rooms and accused her of being insubordinate to collect monetary penalties. But all through it, Hayworth never cowered to him. Hate is a very exciting emotion. Haven't you noticed? Number 5. Judy Garland It's well known at this point that the studio system affected Judy Garland in a worse way than most. Those will take the edge off. No, I gotta sleep tonight. Halpert will give you something for that later, down the hatch. Her substance use disorder was fueled by terrible working circumstances at a young age, and her self-esteem suffered at the hands of MGM. But when the studio tried to meddle in her relationship, she stood up for herself as long as she could. The moment I saw him smile, I knew he was just my style. Garland fell in love with musician David Rose as a young woman and married him in 1941. MGM, like her mom, was reportedly disapproving of the union, believing it would tarnish Garland's public persona. Despite their objections, Garland married anyway. The studio apparently didn't make it easy for the couple, though, and they ultimately divorced. We both know things haven't panned out as well as we thought. So if you can get a break, go ahead, take it. Number 4. Betty Davis Betty Davis was one of the most important and lauded actresses of her generation, but to get Warner Brothers Studios to notice that, she had to fight. You! You're too fine! You won't have none of me, but you'll sit here all night looking at your naked female. After Warner Brothers let her make a movie with RKO, she made waves in the studio's 1934 flick of Human Bondage. It showcased her knack for playing bold, antagonistic women, but Warner Brothers still refused to give her the roles or money she wanted. Although Jack Warner reportedly tried to placate her with the vague promise of the main part in Gone with the Wind, Davis was done. And I was so angry about what they'd been giving me, like all these parachute jumpers and things. I said, I'll bet it's a dilly and walked out of the office. <laughs> she went off to Europe to make movies she liked with a different studio. Things ended in a lawsuit that Davis lost, but she still had the guts to try. I knew that was my future. I, I knew that if that only directors and good scripts could give me a career, I couldn't do it uh, with, with the junk, that's all. Number 3. Katherine Hepburn Aren't we elegant? Well, you'll never be thought so with your slang and manners. I hope not. I don't want to be elegant. Well, you needn't whistle like a boy. That's why I do it. When it came to the studio system, Katherine Hepburn definitely wore the pants. Literally. There was a time when donning pants publicly could get a woman arrested. But Hepburn didn't let that stop her. Bringing dogs, Susie, hasn't stopped yet. I'm out this far, ain't I? The story goes that she would show up to RKO Studios rocking blue jeans, but she came back from filming to find her pants had mysteriously disappeared. If this was some not-so-subtle push from the studio, it didn't work. Instead of donning a skirt like they wished she would, it's been said that she simply walked around in her underwear until someone gave her the pants back. Oh, what a nerve! <laughs> there you are, he's got humor, he's got imagination, he has. That's an icon if we've ever seen one. Number 2. Tyrone Power Back in the days of old Hollywood, studios basically had all the control. Some stars, however, could push hard enough to get their way. Set out to prove he was more than just a pretty face, actor Tyrone Power wanted to star in 1947's Nightmare Alley. Mister, I was made for it. 
Daryl F. Zanuck, the head of 20th Century Fox, had concerns but eventually greenlit it. That was a win for Power, who had persisted to get this win from the studio. I had all kinds of jobs before this one came along, but none of them were anything but jobs. But this gets me. However, when it came to promoting the picture, Zanuck didn't lift a finger. This reportedly hurt Power, who felt Nightmare Alley was among his best works. Later, he actually rejected the part of Albion Hamlin in 1952's Lydia Bailey, a defiant move against Fox that got him suspended. And unfortunately for him, Fox never wanted to change the Tyrone Power formula or challenge him or his audience with more diverse or complex roles. Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. Number 1. Olivia de Havilland There really wasn't any decision, uh, I mean, any doubt about the right decision for me to take. Many stars rebelled against the studio system in small ways and large. While a lot of those stars lost, many paved the way for Olivia de Havilland to win. During her time at Warner Brothers, de Havilland wasn't given roles within the studio that fueled her. She decided to wait her contract out and opted for suspensions rather than take on parts she hated. Her contract was supposed to end in 1943, but the studio added extra time because of those very same suspensions. So the actress decided to take legal action against Warner Brothers over the tack-on contract clause. No actor had dared to take advantage of the law by asking for declaratory relief, which is to say an interpretation of the law as it applied to an actor's contract. She won, thus also changing the game for her peers. She ultimately thrived, as evidenced by her work in such films as The Heiress. The first time, he only wanted my money. Now he wants my love, too. Well, he came to the wrong house. Do you agree with our picks? Check out this other recent clip from Ms. Mojo. And be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.